expected perspective on this. We asked them to address, to address each in their own way, the fraying of relations between experts, policymakers, and the public. Um, this fraying of relations that has been exposed by the pandemic. It existed before it, but it's also been exacerbated by it. It is evident, evident in the United States in the sort of the overt political pressures um, uh, 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 exerted on the CDC, on the FDA, and the consequent decline in the levels of public trust in the guidelines issued by these agencies. It's also evident in the popular resistance to the imposition of various restrictive measures or even basic safety measures such as um, wearing masks. Yet, if one thought that politicization is the sole problem, one was not paying attention since public clashes and acrimonious disagreement between the experts themselves um, also serve as the backdrop and in some sense enable this politicization. Uh, while they also amplify the cacophony in, the, in what you might call the acoustical environment we all uh, exist in right now, leaving the public bewildered and divided. Um, and all of this is of the utmost political relevance, first because there is by now some empirical evidence that there is a correlation or some relationship between levels of public trust in institutions and the uh, 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 mortality rates. And second, because as Harry Collins says, Experts and expertise are one of the essential checks and balances of functioning liberal democracies. This is why the looming elections uh, revolve to such a degree also around the question of trust in experts. So we've asked our four speakers, how should sociologists um, analyze the factors and processes that contribute to this fraying of relations? What insights can be gleaned perhaps from a comparative analysis looking outside the, the somewhat parochial American context? Um, what have we learned about the determinants and nature of trust that can shed light and perhaps guide interventions in the current moment? Um, and what are the specific vulnerabilities of the different forms of organizing the relationships between experts, policymakers, and the public? How can they be addressed? Now, before I introduce our speakers, I want to briefly mention that this seminar is convened by a team of scholars from Colombia, different departments at the Arts and Sciences, as well as the School of Journalism and Barnard College. These are my colleagues, Peter Bierman, Rebecca Jordan-Young, Colin Leach, Valerie Purdy Greenaway, and Michael Schutzen. There's also a dedicated group of graduate fellows from sociology, anthropology, history, and the School of Journalism. Uh, Musa Argabi, Daniel Carr, Aaron Plasek, and Daniel Thompson. Um, you can see some of their work um, on the uh, event page, the, the links, the blogs, the, the, the list of resources they compiled. In fact, we have a standing uh, invitation to anybody who's inspired by this event um, to contribute a, a blog, uh, to write a blog contribution. You can see the blog su submission guidelines um, there on the event page. Um, the magic behind the scenes, what makes all of this happen smoothly is the wonderful team at Insight um, and the American Assembly. So many thanks to Michael Falco, Mark Lenecker, Emily Kerman, and Julius Wilson. Um, and of course, we'd like to acknowledge and thank the Mellon Foundation, whose generous support makes this event possible. Um, final note, on uh, November 12, uh, on the other side of this looming event, uh, we will convene a third meeting of this seminar with a panel of experts to discuss the question of trust in vaccines, especially the new coronavirus vaccine, with Amanda Kahn of the CDC, our very own James Colgrove, Rupali Limaya from Johns Hopkins, Jennifer Reich from the University of Colorado, and Jane Zucker of um, New York City Health. So we have uh, four speakers today. They are in the orders of presentation, Rogers Brubaker of UCLA Sociology, Steve Hillgartner uh, from Cornell's Department of Science and Technology Studies, Andy Laker from US, USC Sociology, and Zeynep Tufekci, who I believe now is a member of Columbia's School of Journalism. I will introduce uh, each one more fully in the turn. I just wanna notice that, you know, once the last speaker is done, uh, the floor will be open to Q&A. The audience can, can see a Q&A feature on the Zoom dashboard. You can type your question at any time. You can uh, please indicate to, to whom the question is directed. 
You can see all other people's questions. You can vote on which questions uh, you want the panelists to address. And when the Q&A begins, I will read the questions to the panelists in the order in which they were upvoted. Um, okay, our first speaker hardly needs an in, uh, introduction to this crowd, um, but here goes. Rogers Brubaker is professor of sociology at the University of California, Los Angeles, where he holds the UCLA Foundation Chair. Uh, he has written widely on social theory, immigration, citizenship, nationalism, ethnicity, religion, and populism. Um, among his books, there are many, uh, that include Citizenship and Nationhood in France and Germany, Nationalism Reframed, uh, Ethnicity Without Groups, Nationalist Politics and Everyday Ethnicity in a Transylvanian Town, Grounds for Difference, and Trans, Gender and Race in the Age of Unsettled Identities. His current book project is about digital hyperconnectivity and its discontents. In 2017, Rogers has published a fascinating article in Theory and Society titled, Why Populism? Uh, where he provided a useful framework for analyzing populism as a discursive and stylistic repertoire, and also began the work of analyzing the structural trends and conjunctural convergence of crisis um, that led to the current populist moment. Recently has followed up this act with a short commentary in Thesis 11, uh, titled Paradoxes of Populism during the pandemic. You can find links to these on our blog page. Rogers, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gil. Unlike the other members of this panel, I have no expertise in expertise. I come to the politics of expertise by way of my interest in populism, and I want to talk about populist challenges to expertise during the pandemic. Populism is a fiercely debated concept without Going into those debates here, I should note that when I talk about populism, I will not be talking about populist movements or parties or leaders. I'll be talking rather about something less solid and substantial, less organizationally cohesive. As Gil noted, I understand populism as a discursive and stylistic repertoire, a set of tropes, gestures, and stances. The core element in the populist repertoire is the claim to speak and act in the name of the people against economic, political, cultural, and also epistemic elites. Among other elements in the repertoire, I'll mention just two that are particularly relevant to our discussion today. The first is an anti-institutional stance that delegitimizes the complex and often opaque workings of mediating institutions, including institutions that produce and disseminate knowledge in the name of an ideology of immediacy and transparency. The second closely related element is an epistemological stance and communicational style that favor plain speaking, everyday experience and common sense against intellectualism, expertise and political correctness. In discussing populist challenges to expertise, I will not be talking specifically about Trump. The president has, of course, drawn emphatically, if also erratically, on the populist repertoire during the pandemic and his vitriolic attacks on expertise in connection with COVID-19 and other issues have obviously contributed significantly to the erosion of public trust in expertise. But an enormous amount has been written about Trump in this connection. And I want to consider instead a broader current of populist skepticism about pandemic related expertise, which may help explain why Trump's attacks on public health expertise have met with substantial, if not majoritarian support. At first glance, there would seem to be something paradoxical about populist challenges to expertise during the pandemic. How could such challenges flourish at a moment when experts and expertise have seemed more indispensable than ever? But the paradox is only apparent. The pandemic obviously dramatically increased, increased the influence, the visibility, and the accessibility of public health experts. The influence of epidemiologists in particular, especially in justifying the spring lockdowns, was truly unprecedented. Never before had so narrow a network of experts exerted so decisive and so incalculably far reaching an effect on the course of world events. But precisely the influence 
the, the visibility and the accessibility of public health expertise have made that expertise acutely vulnerable to populist attack. Expertise is vulnerable to challenge and attack, not in spite of its being indispensable, but precisely because it is indispensable and because the stakes are so high. There's nothing new about this vulnerability. As Gill put it in his excellent book on the crisis of expertise, the inexorably increasing scientization of politics necessarily brings with it the politicization of science. Expertise is continually called upon to help rationalize and legitimize policy decisions, decisions that necessarily advantage some groups and disadvantage others. So in the present crisis, decisions justified with, with reference to expertise have devastated some while merely inconveniencing others. So it's no surprise that expertise would come under attack. Besides the extraordinarily concentrated, consequential and visible influence of expertise, I want to organize my remarks around two additional factors that help explain the resonance and the power of populist challenges to expertise. The first is the gap between what people know relatively directly from common sense and personal experience and what people know about from models and projections. This epistemic gap gives rise to what I will call the experiential challenge to expertise. The second factor I will focus on is the hyper accessibility of expertise, which gives rise to what I will call the participatory challenge to expertise. So let me begin with the experiential challenge. Populism tends to valorize common sense and concrete personal experience, and it tends to be suspicious of abstract and experience distant forms of knowledge. It's easy to see how the corona crisis has activated this suspicion. The extreme unevenness of the pandemic in geographic and social space has created a huge discrepancy between what many people have seen in their own local surroundings, few illnesses, fewer deaths, and empty hospitals, for example, and the dire picture reported from hotspots or projected for the country as a whole. People could easily think that the crisis was overblown and the lockdown unnecessary. Another aspect of the unevenness of the pandemic, of course, is the sharply disproportionate vulnerability of specific groups, including minorities, the urban poor, the incarcerated, and immigrant workers in meatpacking plants, as well as nursing home residents, the elderly, and those with pre-existing conditions. All of this may reinforce the tacit or explicit sense for many people that this is not their pandemic, but one that afflicts others. The virus has of course spread very widely beyond these groups, but it has done so in a manner very different from its dramatic spread in New York in the spring. Even in today's hotspots, many people may not know anyone who has been seriously ill. And this again creates a gap between everyday experience and expert warnings. The epistemic gap between local experience and expert knowledge also has a temporal aspect. For an easily transmissible pathogen like COVID-19, epidemiological time is exponential time. A small outbreak can quickly become a disaster. The urgency of expert warnings in the spring and the case for stringent distancing depended precisely on this exponential temporality. Yet precisely because the warnings were taken seriously early in the pandemic, they could become self-discrediting since the lockdowns in effect suspended exponential temporality and the projected catastrophe never happened. This is what is sometimes called the paradox of prevention. Measures taken to avert an outcome if they are successful can appear in retrospect as having been unnecessary. The dire warnings had of course been conditional. If no steps are taken, then hospitals would be overwhelmed and deaths would soar, but the conditionality was easily overlooked. So here too, the gap between local experience and expert projections has bred suspicion and distrust of expertise. And this makes it harder for expert warnings to be taken seriously the second time around. I turn now to the second factor that I want to highlight, the participatory challenge to expertise. Here, expertise is challenged not on the terrain of everyday experience and common sense, 
but on the terrain of evidence and data. The participatory challenge feeds off what I will call the hyper accessibility of expertise. By hyper accessibility, I don't of course mean that it's easy to acquire expertise, however that slippery term is defined. I mean rather that thanks to digital hyperconnectivity, expert opinions, expert models and projections, expert research and expertise relevant data are more accessible and more abundant than ever. Experts have been addressing the public both directly and through, through things like op-ed contributions, interviews, podcasts, and Twitter posts, and indirectly by talking extensively with journalists. Their views, along with journalists simplifying accounts of them, have been recirculated at high velocity, though often, of course, in fragmented and distorted form, by legions of digitally active lay users. The resultant hyper accessibility of expert opinion makes it easy for lay users to find and share evidence of experts' inconsistency, for example, in views about masking. But it's not only expert opinions that are hyper accessible, it's also the raw materials on the basis of which expert opinions are formed and revised. That is, the projections, the research findings, the public health data. There's an enormous glut of data and research findings. Ubiquitous dashboards convey daily updates and trends on cases, deaths, tests, and hospitalizations. Equally accessible are the numerous forecasting undertakings, which project future trajectories of cases, deaths, and hospitalizations. And many, many thousands of new research papers are freely accessible on preprint servers, not only published work, but also indeed primarily papers that have not yet been peer reviewed. And numerous not yet peer reviewed papers have been drawn into public debates in highly contentious ways. I want to highlight two implications of the hyper accessibility and the superabundance of COVID related expertise, research, and data. Both involve aspects of what one could call the democratization of expertise. The first is the democratization of the means of assessing expertise. For what is accessible in the digital public sphere or what appears to be accessible is not only the content of expert opinion, but also the evidence that appears to support or undermine that opinion. It's easy to find data or new research that can be taken, though of course mistaken also, as suggesting or even proving as some would claim that the experts got it wrong in this way or that. For example, it's easy to cite research and numbers that suggest that COVID-19 is much less dangerous than the experts claimed, indeed, no more dangerous than the seasonal flu. And it's easy, therefore, to claim that the lockdowns were a catastrophic mistake, the greatest mistake in history, as one commentator rather grandly put it. Yet the accessibility and abundance of expertise and research also make it easy for lay people to come to what is, in a sense, the opposite and equally problematic conclusion, namely that the experts don't agree on anything. In both respects, hyper accessibility and superabundance can contribute to undermining the credibility of expertise. The second implication of the hyper accessibility and superabundance of expertise, research, and data is the democratization of the means of claiming and exercising a kind of quasi expertise. Quasi experts, pseudo experts, and lay experts have proliferated. And though it's not easy to claim expertise per se, it is indeed easy to claim the right to join in as a knowledgeable participant in the collective public effort to interpret and define sociomedical reality. As prominent lockdown skeptic Aaron Ginn, a self-described Silicon Valley growth hacker put it, I'm quite experienced at understanding virality, how things grow and data. You don't need a special degree to understand what the data says and doesn't say. Numbers are universal. Now Ginn's epistemologically populist claim to a seat at the table did not go unchallenged. His essay criticizing the case for the lockdown wrapped up two and a half million views on Medium in 24 hours, but it was removed from the platform after a scathing critique from a prominent biologist. This was one of many interventions to have been 
invisibilized by major platforms. Concerns have, of course, been mounting in recent years about the proliferation of misinformation and disinformation in the structurally flat, unmediated, and in that sense, populist digital public sphere in which visibility is driven by algorithmically amplified popularity. And Zeynep uh, has written powerfully and eloquently about the properties of the digital public sphere. Concerns about misinformation and disinformation have intensified during the pandemic. In response, major platforms have been aggressively removing or flagging content deemed potentially harmful from a public health standpoint, but their actions have raised concerns about censorship, generated a populist backlash, and provided grist for the mill of conspiracy theories. The removal of Ginn's essay, for example, prompted a Wall Street Journal article that raised Ginn's profile among lockdown skeptics who could complain with good reason that major digital platforms were colluding in restricting the range of what they deemed to be legitimate views. The participatory challenge to expertise, part of a broader participatory turn in politics, culture, and society is not new. It has roots in long-term developments in the cultural politics of knowledge. These include the decline of epistemic deference, the suspicion of insular forms of expert judgment, the valorization of various forms of lay expertise, and the growing sense, especially in health and lifestyle domains, that lay people must educate themselves, must do the research, as the popular slogan goes, and take responsibility for adjudicating between competing expert claims. But the pandemic and the flood of data it has unleashed have given a major new impetus to that participatory challenge. And this may further discredit and destabilize expertise. As Gill has shown, the crisis of expertise is systemic and longstanding. COVID-19 brings this chronic crisis, if you will allow me this oxymoron, into sharp relief but it also confronts us with an acute crisis of public knowledge. It's not only that normal science, concept that goes back of course to Thomas Kuhn, cannot cope with a situation in which to quote, to quote a recent paper, facts are uncertain, stakes high, values in dispute and decisions urgent. It is also that we inhabit radically different public worlds. The public worlds we inhabit are constituted in significant part by what we know or believe about them. And what we know or believe about COVID-19, not only about what should be done, but about what is the case, is radically discrepant. There is no shared definition of the situation. Is COVID-19 the greatest existential threat in our lifetimes, as the New York Times called it, or is it no more dangerous than a bad flu season? Did the lockdown save more than 3 million lives in Europe, as one study claimed, or as others have claimed, were they not only medically ineffective and economically catastrophic, but likely to have disastrous health consequences, especially in poor countries, for example, by disrupting vaccination programs? Is a targeted strategy of protecting the vulnerable while allowing others to resume normal life the best way of minimizing mortality and social harm as proposed in the Great Barrington Declaration? Or would adopting this strategy be tantamount to mass murder, as one critic none too subtly argued on CNN? I would like to conclude by briefly placing the crisis of public knowledge in broader perspective. Polling data show increased trust in science since 2016, perhaps in reaction to Trump. Yet the legitimacy of the institutions that generate and disseminate knowledge, science, universities, and the mainstream and elite media seems more fragile than ever before. And we are only beginning to come to terms with the epistemic implications of a communications ecology based on digital hyperconnectivity, an area in which Zeynep has done important work. So let me conclude by simply stating without developing or defending five assertions. First, digital hyperconnectivity exacerbates long-term processes of epistemic democratization that erode epistemic deference and undermine epistemic authority. Secondly, 
the communicative superabundance fostered by hyperconnectivity contributes in differing ways both to epistemic polarization and to epistemic paralysis, fatigue, and skepticism. Third, there's a strong affinity between the commercial and algorithmic logic of popularity that organizes communication in a regime of digital hyperconnectivity and the cultural and political logic of populism. Fourth, digital hyperconnectivity facilitates and rewards a populist style of communication characterized by dramatization, confrontation, emotionalization, personalization, visualization, and hypersimplification. And lastly, robust conceptions of democratic citizenship are unthinkable without at least minimal assumptions about the institutions that generate public knowledge and promote deliberative reason. But today, even the most attenuated assumptions seem wholly untenable. I will end on this cheerful note. That was a cheerful note. Thank you, Rogers, for um, lifting our spirits. <laughs> um, okay, uh, our second speaker um, is Steve Hergartner. is a professor of science and technology studies at Cornell University. His research examines the social dimensions and politics of um, contemporary and emerging science. Um, what is for a second, especially in the life sciences. Um, his, recent, uh, his early book, um, Science on Stage, Expert Advice as Public Drama, won the Society for Social Studies of Science Rachel Carson Prize. It is by now a classic. Um, it analyzes the backstage, front stage organization of expert advice at the National Academy of Sciences. Reading it uh, today during the current, mo current moment, as I did with my class uh, this semester, was highly rewarding. Um, Hilgardner's most recent monograph, Reordering Life, Knowledge and Control in the Genomics Revolution, um, examine how quasi-legal knowledge control regimes take, took shape during the Human Genome Project. Hilgardner is um, currently completing a project on the politics of making knowledge about risk. And since May, he's been leading or co-leading with Sheila Jasanoff of Harvard, um, uh, a comparative study that examines the relations between expertise, trust, and policy making uh, in different countries during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, results from this research, I understand from Steve, are still coming in. And so Steve will speak today mostly about the American part of the study. Thank you, Steve, please. Thank you, Gil. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, uh, this um, promises to be a very interesting event um, and it already has been. Um, the question that I want to ask today um, is not what causes distrust in science and expertise, uh, nor whether or why distrust in expertise is increasing or to what extent the current levels of distrust in science are historically unprecedented. I also don't want to ask what, if anything, can be done about our predicament regarding the place of expertise in contemporary democratic politics. Instead, I want to explore very briefly and incompletely the following question. What do claims about high levels of distrust in science and technical experts accomplish? That is, what do they do in the world? What sorts of conceptual and rhetorical work do these claims facilitate in public reasoning and public debate? And obviously these are slippery questions because a statement like there's rising distrust in science can invoke any of the many meanings of the term science. It might refer, for example, to a body of knowledge, to a set of methods, to a science-based technology, to a community of scientists, a social institution, maybe some specific organizations, uh, and so forth. Um, but, um, and so as a concrete example, I wanna consider how claims about distrust in science and in public health expertise are being used to help explain the poor performance of the United States in the COVID pandemic. That is, how distrust in science is part of the explanation of why the US has totaled more than 8 million cases, more than 220,000 deaths with massive job losses, economic hardship, school closing, ongoing disruption of daily life, and the prospect of a dark winter ahead. Now, a starting point for thinking about this is to, I think, recognize that in the contemporary world, there are no natural disasters, only socio-technical ones at this point. Disasters are 
deeply entangled in technological systems and infrastructures. And so even disasters that are widely classified as natural will inevitably implicate human artifacts, organizations, and choices. And in what Ulrich Beck calls uh, the risk society, the socio-technical networks intended to monitor and manipulate and manage risk have reached a level of density where any disaster, whatever uh, natural agency uh, it's attributed to will fall under the jurisdiction of some set of technical experts and organizations. So a process of establishing accountability uh, takes place uh, and they, these begin typically while the disaster is unfolding and they may continue long afterwards through a series of ex, uh, investigations and public inquiries aimed at assessing cause and blame, defining specific artifacts, individuals, organizations, and so forth as deviant, identifying preventive strategies, punishing wrongdoers, aiding and compensating victims, and so on. And um, this, um, in a case uh, like COVID with a slowly unfolding disaster, the ongoing social accounting is playing a significant role in influencing events on the ground. In, indeed, you could say that part of the COVID event is the ongoing effort to explain it. In the US and in some other countries, the dynamic struggle to establish who and who is not accountable has become one of the central features of the action. So this is the context from which I wanna consider claims about trust and distrust in expertise. And just to have a concrete example, I wanna consider one specific line of argument, which I'm gonna call the unopened playbook account. And in the unopened playbook account, the Obama administration and the Bush administration before it had constructed plans based in science and expertise for managing a pandemic. Uh, the narrative argues that we were prepared, we knew what to do, but the plan wasn't followed. And there's a particularly nice articulation of the unopened playbook narrative in a video op-ed by Johnny Harris, Nicholas Kristoff, and Adam B. Ellick. Uh, the video titled, America Wrote the Pandemic Playbook and Then Ignored It, was published by the New York Times in September. Just to very briefly gloss its argument, which is conveyed visually and uh, rhetorically quite um, uh, persuasively, there was a plan. Um, the plan was left. It was called to attention, the attention of the president, but it wasn't followed. Science wasn't followed. Instead of leaders who did what needed to be done, and we you know, had a, a plan for what needed to be done, we had leaders who denied that COVID was a major problem. Obviously, the most prominent among these leaders is Donald Trump, the Trump administration's lack of deference to authoritative scientific knowledge uh, leads to an improper policy grounded in incompetence and his active encouragement of anti-expert sentiment contributed to the formation of extensive opposition to public health advice. And in the closing lines of the piece, Christoph says that the death certificates of a large number of Americans will say something like COVID-19 but in a larger sense, what should be written on those death certificates as the cause of death is incompetence. Now, I wanna back up from uh, the um, uh, sort of argument itself for a second and ask the question of what sort of world does the unopened playbook narrative imagine? And I would say that the narrative imagines a world in which the playbook as a sort of piece of managerial technology is quite powerful. It's something that is capable of leading its users to accept its premises, goals, and recommendations. Government officials are imagined as being in, attentive to expert advice. And when initial signals of, of a potential pandemic come in, incomplete signals, and, but real ones, the plan is quickly activated. Uh, the federal government follows the plan. The playbook imagines the uh, implementation of testing. It imagines the dedication of major resources to trying to contain the, the virus. It imagines uh, necessary steps like coordinated lockdowns being carried out. It imagines consistent health communication messages being issued by the government. 
The playbook also imagines that citizens will follow the government's advice once it's issued, that each sector, the experts, the government, and the public will play the roles prescribed to them relatively well. It's an imagination of a very obedient world in which both officials and citizens are led by experts who they follow willingly. Now, as an empirical matter, we now know that in the COVID case, neither government officials nor citizens are necessarily so compliant, client, are necessarily so compliant as this optimistic vision suggests. We also know from much scholarship, as well as from national differences in COVID responses, that scientific data doesn't dictate a single policy approach. There's always interpretive flexibility in regulatory science and in assessing and managing risk. And in regulatory contexts, which typically involve making decisions at the frontiers of research, knowledge claims are often contested and knowledge is complete, ambiguous, and plagued by unfillable gaps. Conflicting values and interests shape the assessment of evidence. Different observers often make different judgments about the evidentiary threshold at which they should make the crucial move of deciding to treat a knowledge claim as a fact. The tension between the newest knowledge and the most reliable knowledge becomes very difficult to manage. And in this context, with conflicting values and different ideas about how tensions uh, regarding things like civil liberties should be managed, public health policies therefore become deeply and unavoidably po political, but the politics are not just in the, in the response, they're in the knowledge itself, in the judgments about what counts as a fact for purposes of policy making. Now, of course, institutionalized systems for doing regulatory science are often able to issue policy recommendations and produce knowledge that audiences find persuasive or at least acceptable. But a vision of scientific facts purged of politics driving decision-making is too simple. And it's very hard to sustain this vision if it becomes visible. Now the unused playbook account doesn't open up these challenges of making policy. It treats expert advice as a relatively unproblematic thing without reflecting on how a polarized political environment makes it difficult to stabilize not just policy that comes after the knowledge, but the knowledge that formulates the basis for policy. Put another way, this narrative doesn't frame the, the problem as one of, in, of involving the formulation of knowledge and expert advice. The problem is framed as one of reception of prepackaged plans, expertise, and knowledge. When in actuality, the real challenge is how to create knowledge and politics that work together to manage the crisis while recognizing that the knowledge and the politics are not wholly separable. The unopened playbook narrative explains the COVID disaster as an example of the failure of some rather identifiable system components in the socio-technical systems dedicated to maintaining public health, in particular, the White House. And there is absolutely no doubt that Trump is a divisive, incompetent, and corrupt figure. So this critique looks very strong, especially at first glance. But a deeper critique of the unopened playbook account might be useful, especially if we want to learn something beyond the idea that people like Trump should not be elected. Um, the deeper critique would note how the unopened playbook explanation is an example of a particular and rather common way of framing technological disasters, what uh, might be called the failure narrative. And in failure narratives, some component of these complicated socio-technical systems, it could be a, a material part, it could be a person, an organization, or a White House. This component fails to perform as required. And there'll be uh, arguments and discussions about what is the more fundamental cause. So for example, in Diane Vaughn's excellent study of the explosion of the Challenger space shuttle, she identifies the root cause of the disaster, not as the O-rings that failed in the booster rockets, but as the rise of a culture 
in NASA that normalized deviance. Failure explanations, however, have to be viewed as relatively optimistic, even given that their advocates typically concede that one cannot hope to completely eliminate component failures. Organizations are going to make mistakes. People will fail. Parts will fail. But in the playbook account, things could and should have turned out better. And this is key about, about the failure narratives. If you can identify the component and discipline the component, replace the component, um, wrap new controls around the component, um, then you can make things turn out better in the future. And this is the sense in which I mean that it's relatively optimistic. Many Americans' deaths would have been avoided if the occupant of the White House had been someone more competent, less corrupt, and less divisive than Trump. That's probably true, um, but we can ask the question of what kinds of narratives are being excluded by, a, by the failure account. They express a vision of a managerial world in which things go according to plan. And as such, they deal with some of the sort of existential dread and so forth that people in, experience around disasters. Disasters evoke shock and fear and horror, not just because they make visible death and suffering, not just because they cause losses, but also because the visibility of this disorder reveals the limits of plans, the disorderly ad hoc nature of socio-technical systems. They show how things don't follow a neat managerial vision. They pretend the possibility of even deeper disorder to come. And so for this reason, reestablishing a sense of normalcy requires not only containing the virus, but also containing it discursively in some reassuring narratives. What I wanna suggest is that the playbook narrative is relatively reassuring on some level. It's not reassuring at all that we have an incompetent, divisive and corrupt person in the White House, but it offers a mode of discursive containment because it foreshadows the possibility of a post-failure world in which managerial orderliness is restored. If Trump and people like Trump can be banished from positions of power, then we can go back to a kind of technocratic and orderly managerial world. There are of course other less reassuring possible ways of understanding the causes of socio-technical disasters. One prominent one is Charles Perrault's normal accident theory. So for Perrault, identifying a component whose failure seems to be, have been the cause at first glance isn't the true cause. The true cause is structural. Accidents become inevitable in complex, tightly coupled systems. And focusing on individual causes or sequences of events misses the deeper structural causes. Now, if we thought about that kind of account for thinking about uh, the COVID crisis, this would point more in a direction where in a densely networked global order with air travel and people flying around and uh, economic tie-ins and so on, uh, disasters like COVID are inevitable. And at some of them perhaps cannot be managed. And even if some countries are able to manage the disaster, serious losses at the global level will occur uh, because of the interconnectedness of economic action uh, and because uh, of the, of the um, possibility of the virus returning. No playbook in the view of a normal accident theorist can definitively prevent problems. Uh, and you know, Perot specifically argues that adding additional controls to systems to try to make them work better just increases their complexity and uh, doesn't solve the problem. Okay, so the unopened playbook narrative, I've argued, offers a relatively optimistic view. And it's a vision that fits with calls to follow the science, to listen to the public health experts, to trust in expertise. And distrust in expertise, especially on the part of some important political actors, becomes a key part of the explanation of the US's disastrous COVID response. 
In this context, claims about a lack of trust in expertise have to be understood not only as descriptive statements that describe the world in which we live, but also as performative ones, statements intended to act on the world. They can act on the world in a variety of ways, by discrediting adversaries, mobilizing support, reasserting the need for expert authority, and as I've argued here, reassuring people that technocratic modes of government governance can be made to work if only the citizens and the leaders would fall in line behind a reliable and apolitical science. It's worth noting that this sort of narrative also has the effect of diagnosing Trump supporters or Trump sympathizers or lockdown uh, opponents as the problem. And perhaps we'll learn a bit about how the various audiences who are being appealed to by this kind of argument respond to it and its multivalent messages on November 3rd. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Steve, for this provocative talk. Um, I'm sure it will uh, generate questions and maybe perhaps the other speakers could also uh, address questions to each other when we get to that. Um, okay, uh, next talk. So um, unlike most of us, our third speaker, Andy Lakoff, was prepared for this moment. Uh, just three years ago, he published a book aptly titled Unprepared. Global Health in a Time of Emergency. It is a deep, engaging, and timely analysis of the emergence and competition between alternative global, health, global public health regimes during the pre previous pandemics, H1N1, SARS, Ebola, and others. And it is reading it, reading also Andy's 2015 Economy and Society paper, Real-Time Biopolitics, which I've done with my class, um, is truly enlightening. Um, when you are observing uh, some of the developments now. Um, Lakoff is professor of sociology at uh, the University of Southern California, it, where he also directs the Center on Science, Technology, and Public Life. He's also the author of the wonderful Pharmace Pharmaceutical Reason, Knowledge and Value in Global Psychiatry, and with uh, Steve Collier, he's uh, author of a forthcoming book, a uh, very timely one, the Government of Emergency, Vital Systems, Expertise, and the Politics of Security, which is due to be published next year by Princeton University Press. Andy, please. Um, well, thank you very much for the introduction, Gil, uh, and, and for organizing this event. Um, I think I have some slides that are coming up. Let's see if they show. Yeah, there they are, great. Um, so our panel has been asked to consider the fraying relations among experts, policymakers, and the public during the pandemic, in particular with respect to the problem of the decline of public trust in expert advice. In my talk, I want to lay out some provisional thoughts on an event that is still unfolding, having to do with regulatory authority over the assessment of candidate vaccines for COVID-19. And this is a US-based case. Um, the event I'm going to describe can be seen as an attempt to repair these fraying relations. I'll talk about uh, FDA's recent success in fending off White House efforts to shortcut the drug authorization process in the hopes of being able to produce an October surprise, an approved COVID, va COVID vaccine in advance of the election. And my focus will be on the role that public trust or the construct of public trust has played in defending the autonomy of the regulatory process from political interference. Uh, first slide, please. So let me begin with a quick overview of the federal government's strategy for vaccine development, testing and distribution called uh, after Star Trek Operation Warp Speed. And this is perhaps the only well-coordinated uh, or semi-well-coordinated federal effort to address the pandemic. It was announced in April with an audacious goal of delivering doses of an authorized vaccine in less than a year, a far shorter time period than any prior vaccine development process had taken. Coordinated jointly by the Departments of Health and Human Services and interestingly, the Defense Department, it has contracted with a number of ph pharmaceutical companies to support R&D and manufacturing uh, with 
funding support in the billions of dollars. And it has been moving very fast. Four vaccine candidates had, had, entered, vaccine, had entered phase three trials by September. And these are ambitious trials that must enroll between 30,000 and 60,000 research subjects each. Some of the um, pharmaceutical companies involved initially promised to deliver preliminary results as early as October or November. And they are already producing millions of doses of vaccine to be stored in anticipation of authorization for distribution. What has enabled this shortened timeframe is a framework of regulatory exception. And this is something I wanna focus on in the talk what's called the emergency use authorization. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the emergency use authorization, the EUA, is a device that enables regulators to authorize a medical product to go on the market without going through the normal regulatory process, including thorough analysis of the risks and benefits of the product based on statistical analysis of a phase three trial. The EUA comes from the world of national security, specifically bioterrorism preparedness. It was initially a provision of the 2004 Project BioShield legislation, which was enacted in the aftermath of 9-11 and the anthrax letters. The scenario it sought to address was a mass casualty biological attack in which an urgent need for treatment, um, but, but in which there was an urgent need for treatment, but no available medical countermeasure. So there would be no time for a prospective drug or vaccine to go through the lengthy regulatory approval process. The EUA allows FDA to facilitate availability and approved uses of medical countermeasures needed to prepare for and respond to uh, CBRN, that's chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear uh, emergencies. And its first use was by the Defense Department in 2005 for an anthrax vaccine to be given to soldiers. And of course, the anthrax vaccine couldn't th go through a normal clinical trial uh, with human subjects since the disease is not prevalent in the population. In 2006, in the context of worries about an upcoming potential H5N1 or avian flu pandemic, the provision was expanded to include emerging infectious diseases such as pandemic influenza. The use of an EUA first requires a declaration of a public health emergency by the Secretary of Human Service, Health and Human Services um, and an emergency that threatens national security. FDA statutory criteria for issuing an EUA, EUA include the disease must be life-threatening, uh, it must be reasonable to believe the, pro the product may be effective for the specified use, the known and potential benefits of the product outweigh its known and potential risks, and there is no available alternative. So in this emergency situation, uh, uh, a tentative risk benefit analysis is to be made by regulators on the basis of limited information. And so a debate can arise over just how much information is needed before one can make a credible finding that benefit outweighs risk and authorize the product to be used. So a vaccine candidate would presumably have a different threshold of risk data than a life-saving drug candidate in that vaccines will be taken by millions of healthy individuals. According to its guidance on how to issue EUAs, FDA is to decide on a case-by-case -case basis what kind of evidence it needs on efficacy and safety and how it will calculate the risk-benefit ratio. And it is this interpretive leeway that has led experts outside of government and inside of government to fear in the last couple of months that FDA would be subject to external political pressure to authorize a COVID vaccine using the EUA mechanism before an adequate regulatory assessment could be made. Next slide. So the EUA process became an urgent source of concern for scientists and public health experts in late August of this year with the public appearance of FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn alongside President Trump and uh, Health and Human Services Secretary Azar to tout the still unproven efficacy of convalescent plasma therapy in treating severe COVID and announced that an EUA for its use had been issued. And this was in the wake of an EUA issuance for hydroxychloroquine several months before, followed uh, famously by a, by a retraction when the drug proved ineffective. In an open letter, the editor of Medline, Eric Topol, called for Commissioner Hahn to pledge a rigorous vaccine assessment process 
or else immediately resign. The editor of Science wrote an editorial assailing the Trump administration and calling on the medical community to refuse to administer a vaccine authorized under questionable circumstances. Career scientists within FDA uh, sought to defend the agency's autonomy, writing a joint op-ed in USA Today, arguing that external interference undermined uh, the agency's credibility. Next slide, please. Forget about this. And in addition, industry leaders weighed in with an open letter to vaccine developers in support of the historic independence of the FDA, free from external influence. Note in these quotations the centrality of preserving public trust to these demands that the White House not interfere in the regulatory process. So the assumption here is that the success of a mass vaccination campaign would hinge not only on the biological efficacy of the vaccine to be demonstrated in clinical trials, but also on the willingness of a substantial proportion of the population to actually take the vaccine. And here the specter of vaccine hesitancy loomed. Next slide, please. FDA was calling for a vaccine candidate to demonstrate that at, le at least 50% efficacy in a clinical trial. So if only 50% of the population was willing to take the vaccine, the vaccination program might well fail to stem the pandemic. In parallel and in interaction with the scientists' anxiety about the EUA process, a number of surveys reported decreasing public confidence in the regulatory process and decreasing willingness to take a potential COVID vaccine. A Pew study released in September reported that between May and September, the percentage of respondents who would definitely or probably take a vaccine had dropped from 72% to 51%, with over three quarters of respondents indicating that they thought a vaccine would likely be approved before its safety and efficacy had been fully assessed. What should we make of these numbers? I agree with Gilayal quoted here, who argues that public trust in science or in government regulation is not best conceived as an attitude that can be measured in numbers. Rather, he tells us, it is embedded in relationships, a byproduct of institutional mechanism, mechanisms. Phenomena such as vaccine hesitancy point to a sense of, a colla of collapsing foundations for prudent action, a fraying of the relationships that enable trust to be lent unthinkingly. And we might suggest that the scientists who were defending FDA autonomy were trying to shore up this system. But my interest here is not in whether these surveys are in fact actual, accurately measuring public trust in a COVID vaccine or in how to explain this apparent decline in levels of public trust. Rather, I want to suggest that such measures of public trust or rather distrust served as a resource for scientists and regulators who sought to insulate FDA from political pressure to rapidly authorize a COVID vaccine. Next slide. By mid to late September, a bureaucratic battle was unfolding between a FDA scientists and the Health and Human Service Services Secretary, as well as the White House, over how vaccine candidates would be assessed as companies began to apply for emergency use authorizations. Again, with the specter of a, of a potential pre-election October surprise um, approval of a vaccine. FDA scientists drew up new guidelines for vaccine developers that sought to emulate as closely as possible given a shortened timeframe, the kind of regulatory scrutiny that a normal biological license application would require. So clinical trial subjects would have to be tracked for two months for adverse reactions, and a minimum, of severe, a minimum number of severe COVID cases would have to be included in the control group numbers. The adoption of these new guidelines would necessarily extend the timeline before an authorization would be possible to a date beyond the election. The White House indicated it was likely to bury these proposed guidelines, which the, which the president later attacked as a political hit job by the deep state. At this stage, with a high stakes meeting of the external advisory groups on vaccines scheduled for October, FDA performed what the editor of science called bureaucratic jujitsu. They inserted the new guidelines um, in an obscure place, the briefing materials that were posted online uh, for participants 
in this October meeting. Increasing trust in vaccines was the, the FDA's lead eva vaccine evaluator noted the rationale for these new guidelines. Next slide. Oh, sorry, no, I'll get to that. Um, so this point was echoed by a group of former FDA commissioners who argued in the Washington Post that a, White, that a White House effort to tip the scales on how safety and benefits would be judged um, uh, would be judged. The impact on public trust will render an ineffective vaccine much less so. And it was also um, echoed by a biotech industry group in a letter to Secretary Azar insisting that the guidelines must be published openly. Um, and they wrote, we cannot allow a lack of transparency to undermine confidence in the vaccine development process. FDA supporters cited the specter of public vaccine hesitancy in, de in defense of the new guidelines. The implications of the Pew survey data were potentially dire, wrote the former FDA commissioners. In addressing the most urgent question of the day, when the FDA approves of COVID vaccine, will Americans accept it? Perhaps due to the collective pressure of these various allies from academia, government, and industry, the White House did not, in the end, block the release of the new guidelines. It was, the New York Times declared, a win for civil servants. Vaccine hesitancy, or the, the specter of such hesitancy, had in this situation changed its normative status from a problem to a resource. For over two decades, scientists and public health specialists have seen vaccine hesitancy as a problem for the public understanding of science, a problem of irrational fear sparked by rumors and misinformation. And the task for experts and officials has been to use transparency, community engagement, and other strategies of risk communication to assuage this fear. But here, the relation of science and expertise to public mistrust shifted. The specter of vaccine hesitancy became a resource to defend autonomy rather than a target for correction. So some suggestions in conclusion. The public health emergency of the pandemic has generated an experiment in the reconstruction of a regulatory order binding experts, policymakers, and the public. The construct of public trust and the specter of vaccine hesitancy has, in this case, enabled experts to fend off external interference, at least for the time being. But because the authorization process remains within the undefined regulatory space of emergency, there is still considerable negotiation to take place over what the reconstructed procedure for vaccine assessment will look like. The questions now being raised are technical, but they are pressing. What will be the endpoints of the study? Will the trial be able to demonstrate efficacy for preventing severe disease? Will it have the time or the size to be able to indicate potential adverse health events at population scale? How will it be possible ethically to continue the trial once an EUA is granted based on partial results? So despite the strategy, FDA's strategy to return to mechanical F objectivity to emulate the normality of the clinical trial process via technical risk assessment, um, we might suggest that the actual public will likely intercede to make claims about how these questions should be addressed in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for this uh, fascinating talk. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to it. I can see some connections and, and um, maybe some disjunctures with Steve's talk. Um, now for our fourth speaker, uh, she also probably needs no introduction to this crowd. Um, Zeynep Tufekci, um, her page says that she is an associate professor at the UNC School of Information and Library Sciences. I want to say was because, you know, she is also now becoming a member of Columbia's School of Journalism. Previously, she was also a faculty associate at the Harvard Berkman uh, Klein Center for Internet and Society. Um, her research in, interest in the revolve around the intersection of technology and society, particularly social movements um, and civics, privacy and surveillance and social interaction. Her book, Twitter and Tear Gas, The Ecstatic Fragile Politics of Network Protest in the 20th 
uh, 21st century was published by Yale University Press in 2018. It examines the dynamics, strengths and weaknesses of 21st century social movement. During recent months, Tufekci burst upon the scene with a series of insightful, sometimes provocative opinion pieces at The Atlantic, The New York Times, Wired and Scientific American. These are powerful correctives to orthodoxy, calls to action and sage advice in this bewildering time. Uh, the best example, may I say, of pandemic public sociology. Please, Zaina. Thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. And uh, I'm going to come to this topic from the other side. You know, normally I'd be speaking about very much the same things that my panelists have talked about, which are fascinating. And I have so many things I wanna kind of add to or question them or ask them, but I'll get to those I assume in the question and answer. The part I wanna focus on is this um, unusual experience I had in that I have ended up writing uh, on the public health sphere. I am not normally someone who writes about that, although I had, uh, I used to teach uh, pandemic sociology a little bit uh, when I taught sociology, introduction to sociology. It's such a great topic as my panelists have shown that it incorporates everything from you know, global connectedness to understanding network theory to exponential growth. So it was a very good example for, um, you know, young students sort of trying to understand globalization and institutions. But when the pandemic happened, uh, I had also been doing a lot of um, work in Hong Kong for most of last year, studying its social movement in relationship to the public sphere and how it works and, um, because it's kind of interfaces China, but that's sort of just put that aside for a minute. But the um, consequence of that was that I was close to Hong Kong, both in, you know, I was following, connecting, I knew what was going on there. And I had just been planning to return there in early January when uh, we started getting news of a viral pneumonia, mystery viral pneumonia coming out of Wuhan. And at that point, uh, knowing what I knew about you know, past pandemics, SARS had been the one I would use as an example to teach. So I knew most about SARS. So when those news started coming out, I kind of um, realized there was a potential for another pandemic and started following the news, mostly because I, you know, one, it would affect me, of course, like with billions of people. And two, uh, in a very selfish way. I wanted to go back to Hong Kong as soon as possible and continue on my research because I knew the crackdown would come and it would be impossible to continue to do research and we may well be there already. So um, from there to now, I have ended up writing a large number of pieces on the public health side, you know, from so sort of this observer from the outside, including uh, things I thought I would never do, questioning the expertise and the guidance of the CDC, the WHO, on topics like vat masks, uh, airborne transmission, ventilation, <laughs> cluster super spreading, uh, topics I did not think I would do public writing on. And there's a story there, but that's not what I want to talk about and how I ended up doing that. But the thing I've encountered throughout this and the thing I want to raise for us and this panel, and one of the reasons that our pandemic response has been, um, what's the right word, the, our pandemic response has been um, challenging around the world, I think. I don't think this is just a US phenomenon, is that there's a different question here besides why don't the public trust the experts, which is a very good and important question. But the other way around, why don't the experts trust the public? Why do they mistrust the public this much? Um, to explain what I mean, the reason I ended up writing an op-ed on masks for the New York Times in mid-March, when the CDC and the World Health Organization had been saying, uh, don't wear masks, they're not necessary. And in fact, a lot of public health experts were um, telling us across the country and in Europe and elsewhere, 
that they were harmful. Now, being close to Hong Kong and sort of being there, I knew that everybody in Hong Kong was masking up and I knew that Hong Kong, Japan, South Korea had SARS experience and they have top-notch experts themselves, epidemiologists, infectious disease specialists. And I thought, all right, somebody's wrong, right? Because this is something that like they're harmful or not, there could be degrees of it, but there has to be some logic to which one we should be doing. And the more I looked into it, what came out in the Western world was that there was a fear. There are twofold fears, both related to mistrust in the public, uh, uh, the mistrust of the public. And one of them was the idea, because there's a shortage of um, the what we call PP, the N95s and such, that if there was a declaration from the World Health Organization or the CDC that masks were indeed useful, but we were just short, that that wouldn't work, that people would hoard, and that would be a disaster. But somehow that had morphed into, you can't wear them right. They don't work unless you're fit tested. Uh, you'll contaminate yourself. And weirdly, there was these very strong claims that um, it would lead to a false sense of security that people who wear masks will just become very lax in other measures and that will cause harm. Now, to me, both of those are really interesting because sociologically speaking, false sense of security is thrown up, you know, every other uh, safety innovation, you know, seatbelts come up and somebody says, what about false sense of security? It's kind of like pop psychology. Uh, it's very attractive. It's got a Gladwellian feel to it. It's contrarian. You know, it's, it makes people feel clever, I guess, than common sense, except, you know, we have tons of research on it. And for safety devices, it's just very unequivocal that it, that's not how it works. The, the benefits of safety overweigh any risk compensation you can measure. And usually you don't really see much risk compensation. You know, maybe a little bit in like uh, high thrill sports where the risk is the point, but not for things like, you know, seat belts or where you want to stay safe. And if anything, sociological knowledge would say that um, that masks, if only worn for the sake, would induce stigma and be unwearable. And in fact, Asian Americans wearing them early on were attacked. And plus the epidemiology was telling us that there was asymptomatic spread and pre-symptomatic spread. Uh, so just wear it when you're sick did not make sense. The idea that the public just couldn't learn how to wear a mask properly made no sense. Um, I mean, it was just not true. Also, since the masks were intended to prevent transmission, which is a much lower bar than uh, PPE, which is healthcare workers trying to protect themselves. So basically uh, on all sides of this question, uh, there was this profound mistrust of the public coming from the experts that they couldn't manage a responsible response, such as there's a shortage, we're gonna use cloth masks, that they couldn't be trusted to act like irresponsible children, uh, that if they had masks, they would just throw caution to the wind. And there was very interestingly, like this idea that if they had masks, they would stop washing hands. And the washing hands part was an, almost an obsession. I worked with these experts because I got involved in the science of this. I have a peer reviewed article coming out on much sort of working with virologists and other people too. So I end up on that side a little bit. And whenever we would present the evidence, there'd be this obsession with what if it displaces hand washing uh, after you know months of data showing that airborne transmission was occurring and fomite transmission, which is what hand washing protects against, wasn't really showing up in the data. Not that there's anything wrong with hand washing. And why would mass displace hand washing? It was just genuine mistrust of the public. And I think the public feels that and understands that in that the mistrust is both ways. So the second one that I'm going to give as an example is this is like I'm just telling you guys. Uh, um, an unexpected ethnography I ended up doing in an effort to try to understand why the public messaging the way it was among um, public health experts and medical experts. The uh, second part was about uh, airborne transmission, which epidemiologists and infectious diseases from Hong Kong and Japan were very early on uh, saying this is what was happening because they had experience with SARS and MERS where this was the case. 
But we just could not get that message from either the CDC or the World Health Organization. And just like the mask debate, I ended up both writing like a scientific explanation synthesis paper for the public and also having committee meetings with these um, sort of experts in World Health Organization elsewhere. Uh, and one of the things that has struck me was that the common belief that goes back to 1910, uh, that if we say airborne, the public will be scared, that they will think, they will freak out, and they'll think that, you know, disease is everywhere, it's like miasma, and that they will not um, act rationally, that this will be a panic inducing thing. In fact, if you look at you know, sociological work on disasters, looking at the public as a problem, a group of irrational people who will panic and mess up the playbook as the previous um, comments, you know, the, the, this was really, I, I was really interested in that sort of like that technocratic solution ideal that there's the playbook only if the public and the sort of the uh, administration would list, uh, follow it and only if the public would follow that playbook right it's like a two-sided thing if you would listen to the technocratic solution everything would be fine is a common uh feeling but it is not that we are cooperating as much as the experts are right and we will tell you and the fear is that the public will come and mess it up in fact one of my very um, uh, interesting observations about this has been, uh, for me, interesting, is the uh, movie Contagion. It's a popular version of this idea. And if you sort of saw it, uh, it's a movie that's praised for explaining the science and getting the science right. There's CDC, there's a scientist, she explains or not, uh, the basic reproduction number and all of that. So. Unlike a lot of pandemic movies, which are unrealistic and the virus is not like any virus we would know, this one is modeled after, it's a cross of two existing viruses and it's like the virus part is correct. But if you look at the sociology of the movie, uh, it is wild. Uh, it is, so what happens is the CDC is of course up to the job, is wonderful, but the public panics on day like seven in the movie or day 10, uh, grown men are beating up little girls and stealing their food and nurses are no longer showing up to work. Uh, whereas, you know, we've now been through a pandemic, uh, nurses wear garbage bags and show up to work, right? Uh, even when they're dying from lack of um, PPE, which we're not ready for. And if anything, the public around the world uh, has been very participatory and waiting, wanting to be told what the playbook was almost. Now, this brings me to a final point on how this is playing out, which is um, very related to the previous comments. And one of them is the, um, the public sphere as we have it now is algorithmically enhanced and also human vulnerability enhanced in both ways to highlight dissent and disobedience and the tantrums rather than the public genuinely trying to participate just like the movie Contagion makes these claims. There's a conception of the public that is filtered through your social media that absolutely gives um, a different view of the world than you would if you did a systematic study. Even in the United States with an enormous amount of um, top-down provocation against masks, uh, the compliance is quite high. And this is after like a complete bungling by the CDC, complete bungling by the World Health Organization, absolutely uh, maddening confusion from the public health sphere across the board. Um, opportunism and grift all over the place. The public is still, you know, if you look at it, it's 80, 90, 100%, depending on where you look at it, people are trying to both protect themselves and do their part. Um, but that is not what you would see if you went on social media, because the thing that is catching for a social media algorithm is that woman in the supermarket throwing a tantrum because she was asked to wear a mask. No matter how rare that event, it's kind of like a continuation of 
um, sensationalist journalism where the, you know, man bites dog would be news, even though it's rare. And it is in line with previous series of uh, media cultivation theory, for example, where if you keep watching certain kinds of evening news, you get more fearful and you get an incorrect view of what the world is like, which feeds the polarization, of course, because if you think there's some people uh, throwing tantrums, um, then, you know, if, if you think that's very common, this is who to blame rather than a failure across the board, not just of uh, this current administration, but the institutions and the experts as a sphere that we were supposed to be able to rely on, but whose mistrust of the public blocked them cognitively from coming to terms with what their expertise should have told them, uh, which is the truth and uh, an understanding that informed the public rather than treated them like a managerial object to be manipulated uh, because otherwise they would behave irrationally and not do the right thing because of false sense of security, because of you know, being too afraid, because they wouldn't know how to wear a mask, all of those things. So in some ways, the um, failure of trust is mutual and reinforcing and is also very much reinforced by the information ecology, be it the social media algorithms or the logic of um, sensationalism and the attraction of the novel or the misbehaving and the in-group out-group process that focuses on covidiots who are the cause for the mess rather than all of us, you know, top from top to bottom almost, uh, especially our institutions that were not ready, that did not act, our experts that did not inform. And to this day, uh, it took till October of 2020 for the Centers for Disease Control to change its guidelines to include the fact that is not even in contention that there is aerosol transmission. And the World Health Organization to this day will not do it. And uh, having been in the expertise process uh, in the mask situation, what I have found again is um, a few people who just do not trust the public to be able to handle uh, these kinds of messaging. And they think people will just sort of um, behave irrationally or um, as I said, uh, some of these, it's a very sort of interesting ethnographic experience, uh, even though I'm not doing it as a study, in that there are people whose careers were defined by them trying to get doctors and nurses and hospitals to wash hands. And that's just been translated into the pandemic sphere where they're just afraid the public will stop washing their hands if they take, um, you know, if they wear masks or if they learn about airborne transmission. Um, and this sounds like ridiculous and overly simplifying. And had I not been through these nine months with the kind of experiences I have been, I would have said, this is an overly simplistic view. This is almost like, um, like this is almost like a um, caricature of a sociology of science where um, the institutional and social processes are so overwhelming that we get this as a normal accident, let's say, uh, of the institutions themselves, institutions of public health, uh, but not because the risks are tightly coupled in a mechanical sense, but the mistrust is tightly coupled in a sociological sense between the public that doesn't trust the experts and the experts who don't trust the public. And this is mutually reinforcing. So early on, uh, even in the middle of all of this sort of enormous bundling of the science and the messaging of masks, the uh, public health community was very much saying, listen to the experts, what if you had listened to the playbook? Um, they were selling t-shirts saying, trust me, I'm an epidemiologist, without realizing that, uh, especially in the current public sphere, where uh, as I've discussed, uh, as Roger had spoken about, uh, where the, uh, the participatory nature of questioning the expertise makes the trust me part 
problematic because that trust is questioned every day by the counter publics, uh, which range from ideological opponents to grifters to um, just sort of disagreement. And uh, people can argue over, they have access to the raw data. They can have huge arguments over, um, you know, what do the CDC numbers show and all of those things in an environment in which uh, we don't even have proper tracking of the COVID data without, um, without a few private institutions, like a couple of people from the Atlantic themselves. Uh, I know this because they're, working there, uh, my colleagues, who are tracking the numbers that the CDC normally would have been tracking. So this is an environment in which it's like a cycle of mistrust that is not possible to get out of in this way without realizing how much it runs both ways. Um, so I will find a end by saying that the public health institutions and people not trusting the public is not a new uh, finding. You know, so I think uh, Zainab has um, uh, frozen. Um, can somebody send a quick chat? Let them know about that. I crashed. All right. All right. Yeah. So, well, I was about to end. Uh, I don't know how long I babbled to myself, but I wanted to end by saying that um, this is a very common finding in sociology in which mistrust from the institutions is a complicated, for to the public, is a complicating factor that uh, creates, like, it's part of the disaster and it deepens the disaster and just kind of feeds on itself. And that I'll, I'll leave there so we can have more in the question and answer period. Okay. Uh, you crashed, but you ended, I think, really well. Thank you, uh, Zaynep, for um, inverting the story. I mean, Andy mentioned before, you know, the um, FDA performing a jiu-jitsu uh, act, you know, on the White House, I think you together with Steve performed this judo maneuver on the panel and inverted the question. But our audience does have questions. So um, there's a few questions in the Q&A and I encourage the audience also to add more questions as we are uh, getting into the um, question and answer phase. We have about half an hour to do this. Um, I will read the questions in sort of the order that they have been upvoted. Uh, the first question is for uh, Rogers. No, uh, let me see. Yeah, the first upvoted question is by Alexis Walker. Um, and I, it, it, she says, uh, yes, thanks so much for all these talks. It seems that Dr. Tufekci and Dr. Hilgartner's talk highlight a tension between the technocratic vision of the unopened playbook account, which overly credits the power of the managerial systems, and another kind of technocratic failure of trust by experts vis-a-vis -vis publics but both versions con uh, convening or converging on seeing uh, COVID yuts. Uh, that's the first time I heard this as a primary cause of the current situation. Could you both say a bit more about the tension between these visions? So uh, either Zainab or uh, Steve, you, you can go first. Why don't we have Steve go first because I just ended speaking, I'll listen to him. Go. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that uh, there is some tension between these visions. Um, I suppose that what I would say is that um, if you think about the way that the interplay operates, um, uh, you know, it, I think that Zainab's point about the mutual distrust um, is particularly important. There's a way that distrust of the public is something that the public picks up on. Uh, and, you know, if people are understanding the messages that, you know, they can't be relied on, they're not trustworthy, even their deplorables, if they're understanding that to be the message, um, you know, you're not going to win friends 
uh, with them. Uh, and so that seems to be part of you know, the, the problem that happens. And then this climate of intensely polarized politics that we have in the US, and you know, also arguably, I think we're seeing this throughout the world, there's a way that the virus becomes um, sort of, a, uh, you could think of it as something, uh, we've been talking about it this way in our project, something that um, finds the weaknesses uh, in the society. Uh, just like you know, it, uh, the virus finds um, the pre-existing conditions and weaknesses in the body, the cleavages that exist, the tensions. So if there's a mistrust of experts uh, in the uh, situation, you know, it will be exacerbated. If there's mistrust of publics, it will be exasperated. If there is a public health infrastructure that's highly decentralized, deficiencies of that kind of decentralization will be found. Also, the deficiencies of, of centralization will be found if that's what you're operating with. So um, what, I'm, what I would uh, conclude by uh, saying is that I do see these um, uh, tensions between this managerial vision and a vision of the public as something to be managed is the way that it gets looked at from the technocratic side. But from the public side, it looks like Wow, are we are we being managed? Are we deplorable? Are we the problem? And that kind of tension will get exasperated in um, uh, these situations. I mean, I think that's a great comment, and um, sort of, I mean, to go back to like public health and making um, the public legible has always been closely interconnected, right? Uh, when we talk about sort of making the public legible and the surveillance, usually the public health is the good example. We talk about like, you know, vaccine campaigns as the ways in which the centralized government makes the public legible and for its good, which is true, right? Because I think those things are gains if you wanna speak normatively. But it's not true that they are this um, unalloyed, like for the public good that somehow stands outside of history or the, uh, these tensions in that I think there's an inherent mistrust of the public that is built into our institutions that, um, that is being furthered by the stress test, as Stephen was saying, this is a stress test, right? It's just like the virus finds your immune system weaknesses, a pandemic finds your institutional, social, political weaknesses. It's a stress test for your systems and that's what we're kind of seeing. And the reason I wanted to kind of highlight this is that if only we had the right playbook, the counter version of that is if only we had the right people. Right? There's a lot of this, if only we had the right public that always listened to us experts, uh, which is a very common narrative that we have encountered that almost never acknowledges the failures of the experts, the fact that there are disagreements upon the, between them, the fact that they don't have the sort of um, consensus speak that we could listen to even if we wanted to listen to them. And the fact that the institutions that are supposed to do that synthesis and consensus view for us, uh, both the WHO and CDC in our particular case, uh, have dramatically failed and lost trust in the process. And if for the CDC, maybe you can explain that with a you know, US specific peculiarity, which is you know, the Trump administration, but you cannot explain that for the World Health Organization. You cannot explain that to explain what's happening in Europe. You know, there's a lot of these uh, other examples that show that this mutual mistrust and mutual um, wish we had the right version is true, regardless of this American exceptionalist way of looking at it and thinking this is a uniquely American moment in terms of failure and realizing, you know, we may have a particular uh, wrinkle in our story but we're part of a global uh, failure, I think, in Western societies uh, that highlight this mistrust. And the other thing I wanna say is that sometimes we have the, if only we had the right people, shows up as a form of Orientalism, which explains the Asian success as obedient people. Uh, 
I heard an expert say yesterday, Japan was a small and homogeneous country. I, I you know, I, I laughed through my screen. And I, uh, of course, South Korea, I mean, it, they overthrew a government and Hong Kong, I've been there last year because of a massive uprising. So it's not like there's some obedient people there as opposed to here um, that, and it doesn't, the cultural explanation is mostly um, if only we had the people who listen to their experts, that's the explanation we get from the experts rather than the question I try to turn around and say, why haven't our experts earned the trust the way theirs might have, regardless of you know some projection that there's some you know Asian obedience that's working rather than a more functioning fit between earned expertise and a public willing to take it seriously. Um, Rogers and Andrew, maybe you want to, I mean, I know this question was originally said, you know, it's for Steve and Zainab, but if you want to come in on this issue of the experts trust in the public, I mean, I think it was relevant to with your talk, Andy. Yeah, well, just responding to, to so far with what um, Zainab and, and Steve have said, I mean, I just want to add that there, there actually is a whole field of expertise, which is the <laughs> sociology of disaster, which, you know, for 50 or 60 years has been saying, um, the public doesn't panic. Uh, the you know the public should be listened to, and and interestingly, that that form of expertise has actually fed into technocratic expertise, and certain certain versions of of a playbook, in which um, spokespeople for public health agencies are supposed to figure out how to enroll the public via um, expressing uncertainty about what's unfolding, via transparency about what's known, via giving the public tools um, to act. And if you, I mean, interestingly, if you look back at the Obama administration's response to H1N1 in 2009, they were following that playbook, the CDC was, um, in a way that the CDC, I would argue, was not following it um, this spring. So, you know, interestingly, this is a kind of reflexive form of knowledge already that, that, that has been incorporated into at least some strands of expertise that is um, trying, to, to act, trying to trust the public and, and, and involve the public in response. Uh, Gil, can I add something on yeah, that? Yeah, please. Just I, on, on Zainab's reversal and uh, experts uh, not trusting the public, I wanted to ask, you know, bring up the, the you know, there's one country that's been, you know, just, as, just as we can't help, it, 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 those of us in America, we can't help thinking through the lens of what Zainab has just called American exceptionalism here. The, another another country that's, that's figured in a very interesting way in these discussions is, is both uh, the, uh, a form of exceptionalism that's been both uh, demonized and, and praised, of course, highly politicized, but, but interesting in this connection because of the trust the public angle is Sweden. So I wondered if Zainab maybe had any comment on the, the manner in which the Swedish case has often been presented by Swedish authorities themselves and by others as, as precisely based on trusting yeah. the public. Not, of course, in connection with masks, since masks aren't even worn there, but trusting the public has been absolutely central. So I like the Sweden case is so fascinating because um, it's become a polarized example of, you know, herd immunity people versus non-herd immunity people. Uh, so it's kind of hard to discuss in a way that's data driven because it's just very much in that. But Sweden has a couple of things that are really fascinating in that one, it's a, um, it has strong normative um, participation, right? It's the traditional Scandinavian uh, kind of model where their guidances are stricter than US has had for almost the whole time and more closely followed. Right, so while it's sort of presented as a free for all, in fact, they had the, like a 50 person limit on indoor, trans, uh, indoor gatherings and the sort of expectations of distancing and other things that were communicated by the, their government and from all accounts are widely adhered to. Uh, and outbreaks they had were um, multi-generational immigrant households which I, I'm from the Middle East and I kind of sort you know, we have more low trust society. So I can totally see that normative expectation not working as quickly in a recent immigrant uh, population. So um, that's one, a very good example in that when it's presented as a free for all, 
when in reality, as Rogers has said, it is more of a, here are the guidelines that we will say normatively without necessarily, you know, um, having this lockdown debate. So it doesn't really apply to here or there, but it just gets um, viewed through our American lens as a very different model. It is not. Another very good example of that is Japan. Uh, because of its legal uh, situation, it's never had a lockdown because it cannot. Like it legally cannot order um, a lockdown from the uh, central government. But they have had um, incentives. Like they try to close certain businesses by paying them. But that was incentivized. Like you didn't have to close. You just got a subsidy if you did. And they did a lot of public education um, where they expected and hoped the public would follow, right? So you have these, um, both, and in both cases, for different bunch of reasons, they are not, like Sweden has a very early peak in the sort of, it failed in protecting the nursing homes and all of that. So it has a high per capita death rate, but right now it doesn't look, it looks middle of the road and Japan looks extremely successful. And neither of those were um, um, like UK, or Italy or France right now, or Spain or most of Europe, which came with heavy handed guidelines that were supported by punishment and tickets and fines rather than the normative, you know, trust the public thing. So that's kind of what I will say. And also to the um, disaster sociology, yeah, there's like many, many decades of work that says the public do not like irrationally panic this Hobbesian view, right? I, I think both public health and a lot of expertise, they are very much in a Hobbesian view in which they are the only thing standing between, you know, the Hobbesian world and us, uh, where that's not really supported by um, the evidence. Although I want to say like the, uh, the, I don't mean to say any of this to say the scientific expertise or any kind of expertise is completely irrelevant and the grassroots is sufficient. It's obviously a lot more complicated than that. Okay, maybe we can um, uh, switch to another question from the questions posed by the uh, audience. Um, the most upvoted question is for me. So I'm going to exercise my... Uh, uh, right, as the organizers, I will reply to this question um, in writing. Um, and I will go to the next one. Um, this is by uh, Lisa Dunn. Uh, the Academy frequently makes claims of regulatory capture. This undermines the public trust and Pete's politicians, oops, why is this disappeared? Uh, politicians, industry, and regulators against each other rather than working together to advance public health. Vaccine hesitancy came from fraudulent from a fraudulent article in the Lancet. Mask hesitancy came from an article in New England Journal of Medicine. How can we expect the public to believe anything if the academy cannot even conduct civil discourse within its own ranks? Anybody I think can take uh, this question. Andy, maybe you could jump in and uh, can I add uh, something to the question also? If you can also comment on the role of the pharmaceuticals because um, they appear very slightly in your story, but I think they actually play an important role and not the role that usually is attributed to them. Yeah, um, well, let me start with that with that question and see if I get to the questions yeah. around you know regulatory capture and, and whether anyone should can or should trust the experts. Um, yeah, the, 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 the drug companies are playing a really interesting role in the debate around or, or in the discussion around how to regulate the vaccines. And, and one argument that has been made is that actually, you know, the, the, the scientists in, in the drug industry are as interested as the academic scientists in um, a, a public sense of a um, coherent and rigorous regulatory uh, approval process. And so they, they, in fact, you know, are, are invested in the credibility of the FDA. And in this, in the case that I was describing, they, they indeed um, pushed along with um, various external academic con commentators and uh, insider career scientists in the FDA pushed against this, this political interference. By the same token, there's you know, the, other, the other side, which is, and, and I think um, in the case of vaccines, Pfizer is really interesting in this regard um, because being a first mover and getting your, your vaccine um, authorized first could, you know, 
be a, be a huge benefit. And so they, they, you know, there are, there, there are definitely incentives to, to, to make, to speed up the authorization process as well. So those are a bit contradictory, but in this case, I think um, you saw the pharmaceutical industry uh, allying with academic scientists. Um, I guess my only thought on the, on the question would just be a little bit adjacent to it, which is to say, I think, um, you know, all of us, it's worth reflecting on, on how we know what, what a public is and what it thinks and whether it, whether it agrees with experts or not. I mean, I think we, we toss around the word the public, but the, the question, one question is how, is how is a public that has opinions about expertise or not constituted? Um, how, do we, how do we know what its beliefs actually are? Anybody else wanted to um, jump in on this? Or I can go to the next question. I think we should sort of highlight the publics and the counter publics that are enmeshed in this. And we're kind of simplifying for sure, right? We, we, I mean, I don't want to put the experts as just one more counter public because it's a complicated thing, but there's a way in which it's like we're functioning as if they're all counter publics, right? With an um, tension with another, which is a fascinating part of this, uh, just watching it through the pandemic. I'm informed that, you know, I read incorrectly what is upvoted. You know, I, I, I just looked at it the wrong, the wrong way. Uh, it seems to be the most upvoted question was the first question by Matthew Hansen, and it's to everybody on the panel. Uh, Matthew says, as a physical scientist, it is often frustrating to see the public uh, perception of science as a singular monolithic dispenser of facts. So not just the public is publics, but science is, is sciences since this is nothing like the view of scientific research on the inside. In what ways could it help or hurt public trust in or acceptance of scientific inquiry to make the ongoing developmental nature of knowledge more visible and how could such a move be made? This is for everybody on the panel though. I think, you know, Steve, maybe you want to jump in. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm happy to jump in with that, um, on that. Um, I uh, do believe that it's vitally important for um, every citizen of the 21st century to have, um, a, to the extent this is possible, to have a relatively uh, deep understanding of, uh, you know, science as a process and um, of the way that um, science operates, you know, in the real world. Um, you know, the, the tension between a textbook model of uh, facts, you know, uh, um, and the way that knowledge is created in, you know, actual practice is something that people in my field have devoted a lot of attention to trying to, um, to talk about. I mean, this is a major theme in science and technology studies. How does, how does science make knowledge? And I think for people to have a grasp of that um, would be, enormously helpful, uh, even if sometimes the making of knowledge wouldn't look as, um, you know, sort of perfectly Popperian and, uh, and um, you know, so forth as um, uh, the images that are created, you know, say in education in American high schools or, you know, around the world. Um, so I completely agree that um, it's uh, essential to talk about how science works, um, you know, as a social process and as a process involving interaction and uncertainty and slowly, um, sometimes quickly, but often slowly through a diversity of activity, securing knowledge uh, that uh, we can treat as reliable. Might I just add, add to that, uh, that I think the question could be posed just as well about um, uh, an, a completely misleading public um, understanding of, of how expertise works. And expertise here is something different from science, but we can ask exactly the same question about you know, how expertise works. I think Gil, your book does that brilliantly in, in showing that you know, even, if we, even if we had the perfectly Popperian science, et cetera, that worked in a complete, it, once, scientists or others enter as experts, enter the public realm and try to answer questions that they can't answer for a variety of reasons, then, you know, I think, so if we could reduce public expectations about what expertise can and cannot do, I think that, you know, have a more mod, develop a more modest 
less heroic <laughs> understanding of, of expertise and its intrinsic limitations, I think that would help as well. And it's, it's a somewhat different question than the uh, intrinsic limitations of, of the way science works. So I want to sort of add that in the uh, that's constituted by the social media part of this and the ones that make it on TV, um, we are the experts and this is the science, here's the playbook is a very common theme. And that helps that thing is that science as the singular answer like that the question goes to. Uh, but I, I wanna go back to one thing, you, you know, Gil, your book on um, the autism matrix there's a sort of an interesting lesson from there from the vaccine hesitancy part, right? Because it's not a coincidence that vaccine hesitancy comes first from that community, partly as one of the questioners asked, there's the Lancet article, right? That causes the problem. But the second thing is that's a community that felt very much mistreated. Uh, and as uh, a community that felt like the medical institution had mm -hmm. basically treated their children inhumanely and did not trust them to tell them the truth because, you know, in that sort of shift uh, between autism as the sort of incurable thing or put them in the institution versus, you know, mm -hmm. sort of part of the human condition shift, the, the mistrust that was left over, I think, is part of why the vaccine hesitancy comes from that particular crowd. And for anyone who thinks vaccine hesitancy is something for just the misinformed others, uh, we are going to have vaccine mis uh, hesitancy from the liberal side of the political <laughs> spectrum now exactly because of the process that was outlined in this panel has created a different kind of mistrust, Trump's FDA mistrust. So this kind of mistrust of expertise is often seen as those people who do not understand experts are right. But when it's your community, it is because the experts are not right because we actually have reason to mistrust them. It's kind of an interesting sort of reflexive um, double um, interpretation. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to uh, exercise again my uh, right as the you know panel convener. Uh, Steve had a question for Rogers, and I, I'd like him to uh, be able to ask it because I think the conversation between the panelists is the most useful thing. Yeah, so um, I, I uh, enjoyed your talk a lot. Um, what I would uh, want to ask about is whether or not you would um, see the kind of hyperconnectivity that you're describing as something that fits um, into it more into a failure model or a normative or a um, normal accidents kind of model uh, in um, the way that it would interplay with. Um, you know, decision making in society, and um, uh, with um, uh, some of the issues we're talking about today around um, expertise and and um, regulatory action and so forth. Uh, thank you, Steve. I I, um, I love your comments on, on the critique of the failure model. So I wouldn't want to um, you know use a failure model in this respect. But in a sense, I would answer the question by asking you a question. That is, how can we combine a critique of the failure model um, with nonetheless, you know, institutional critique of various modes of institutional failure. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think you would want to say that because the failure model is hopelessly oversimplified and um, uh, it fails itself to understand um, the way uh, you know, inevitably whatever accidents are produced or anything, I, you wouldn't want then to refrain from a kind of critique of um, very specific modes of failure. After all, one can identify a number of very specific modes of failure in the US case, not many of which are, have nothing to do with Trump. Uh, you know, so, um, so to then coming back to your question for me, of course, you know, it's not, this is, the, this is the ecological landscape of information that we live in. We can't, you know, and, and so of course that landscape will routinely generate all kinds of, you know, as it were normal, problems and just the way it works. And yet at the same time, and it's again, something Zainab has written on very powerfully at the same time, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be thinking about, you know, institutional reforms in, in this, in this, in this landscape. And, you know, it's uh, very hard to think of, of what they exactly should be, but, um, you know, so I guess, you know, I would just, again, coming, you know, I would answer with this question that is how do we combine um, a critique of the failure model with the possibility for, for institutional critique. Well, 
Um, well, I, I actually don't see it as a um, a, a terrible contradiction. Oh, um, I wasn't suggesting it's a yeah, contradiction. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think that I think that um, uh, what the idea that that uh, you know hyperconnectivity of lots of different kinds, uh, material and informational and sociopolitical and uh, so forth, are creating the potential for um, you know unpredictable and uh, unmanageable things, you know, is I, I think something we should reflect on and and grasp and it should um, inject a note of humility into our playbook planning. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, you can live in the world uh, with a model uh, in which um, you, you say, okay, the world is a normal accident, nothing can be done. Um, you know, that, um, so, I don't see it as a contradiction exactly. It's um, it's more um, a, a cautionary note. And as for what institutional characteristics um, uh, work better in these kinds of situations, um, what I'm going to answer the way I'll answer you that is to say let's um, see what we can I can say to you about that in uh, about six months when we're done <laughs> analyzing our massive quantity of data. We, we have just a few more minutes. I want one more question from the audience. This one is an important one and it, it, it continues this discussion. It's by Larry O. Uh, Larry asks, while well, this distrust of public experts is um, exacerb exacerbated by crisis, as Professor Brubaker points out, the populist challenge towards epistemic elite is a chronic crisis. Suppose COVID-19 subsides in the next year or two. What can we do differently to prepare for the next pandemic so that the gap between experts and publics lessens? Are there ways of preparation that does not entail a concentration of power and decision-making in elites? Um, I think all of our panelists can speak to that. Um, maybe Andy, you could, you could start. Um. Well, I, I guess I would start just by very quickly um, moving back to the to the pandemic playbook um, question that Steve has raised, and to say that in addition to the pandemic playbook, there's also another technocratic model of preparation that is that is a little bit more um, uh, ad hoc and and um, improvisatory, which is the game um, or the the scenario. And interestingly, you know, it, it tries to model what what might happen that's unexpected. It tries to provoke the unexpected. And I just, I guess part of, part, one way to break out of um, the scripted assumptions about how, how the public will respond, how, how experts will um, successfully respond to an event is to more subtly program into your exercises um, um, these kinds of unexpected events and also to include um, more people in the event. So perhaps there's a way to to bring about a more, to, to sort of reincorporate the knowledge that we've we've gotten from from seeing these failures um, into um, more improvisatory modes of of planning going forward. Maybe Zayda. Sure. Um, so I mean, it's really complicated. Like, there's not. Let me just sort of say it this way. This question we're this mutual distrust is um, coloring so much that um, it's not what we're discussing right now, but in my particular field, you see this in the Russian misinformation um, debate in which it's almost as if there's a hypnotic effect. We've gone back to hypnosis, right? Like you, you see some social media posts and you're hypnotized rather than understanding, and I'm not saying there was like no Russian meddling or whatever, that's besides the point, right? The point being that there's the um, widespread mistrust in the United States um, of, of its current governing structures. And then you have these events in which, you know, there may or may not be some Russian meddling as part of it, but it's almost like a tiny little symptom of what you're out in the breakdown, right? So I think there's a similar version of that in the public health where um, we're simplifying what is a multi-decade process that uh, other pro you know panelists have kind of spoken about. And it comes up questions. I was just looking at the questions, like questions like regulatory capture, all of those things. So what I would um, sort of the going forward path is to kind of incorporate all of those 
in an environment that recognizes the participatory challenge. You cannot just put down the playbook and walk away from defending it if that's, you know, even if there were the technocratic sort of, if you're going to make an argument, it's more like everything is a player in the public sphere, including technocratic expertise. And to the degree you want to create a special exemption for it in which that, you know, we have science, we have all of this on our side. Um, you have to kind of defend it as you would defend other claims without necessarily, I'm not making a, a ontological claim on whether that's true or not. I'm saying that it has to be defended as such, regardless of one's views on uh, where that stands epistemologically. Uh, Stephen Rogers, you guys are gonna have the last word in this panel because we're already over time. So we've still captured 73 people. You know. <laughs> So, um, yeah, just to, to be very quick, I would say um, uh, that the, the thing to pay attention to is what kinds of social learning we can do from our experiences. And the, the second uh, point would be that reflecting on the implicit ways we imagine the world and the background assumptions we bring um, to it, uh, I think, can be extremely productive um, mm -hmm. uh, in this area. I, well, I agree with everything our, 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 my colleagues on the panel have said about this question. Let me just add one small thing that, you know, there are different temporalities involved, of course, and there are many things we can do to reduce the gap kind of in general between the public and experts. And Gil, Gil's book, again, this is a more recent book on the crisis of expertise, discusses um, a number of initiatives that are made for various forms of lay participation and so on. But, you know, in a sense, and it's, it's when the question was formed in terms of what, what can we do to um, make the gap less at, you know, during the next pandemic. And, it, you know, then there are these temporality issues about what happens when you really need to make a decision, you know, yesterday, right away. Then, you know, it's, it is when the urgent need is for closure or decision making. And then, of course, there are limits to the kinds of more open ended modes of, of involving the public that are important and indeed indispensable and so on. Um, uh, which isn't to say that, uh, you know, as Zainab pointed out um, uh, powerfully here, it's, it's counterproductive to not trust the public and so on, but there, in a sense, we do, we are, you know, the different temporalities and needs for decision-making at different rhythms do impose certain limits there as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd like to apologize to the eight people who are there in the Q&A um, uh, list whose questions we will not be able to answer today but their questions are uh, recorded and um, they're also evidence of the, you know, the importance of the topics discussed and, and the really wonderful contributions and discussion that followed from that. So let me take our, thank our panelists uh, who have taken the time uh, to share their, their thoughts with us. Um, and um, hopefully something good will come out of this discussion of, you know, how do we uh, manage to change this gap and this mutual mistrust um, between experts and the public. I'll see you all, I guess, on the other side. I mean, the other side of Tuesday, um, at one point or another, um, and we shall see. But thank you very much, everybody, Roger, Steve, and Andy, and Zainab, uh, for these wonderful contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And there's a lot of thanks from the from the audience, I could see. Right.